Hello friends, so welcome to the studio and to my personal Bible study. The reason I am doing this is to review myself of, my, of the doctrines because I read in Matthew 13, Jesus said that those who don't understand the word will be carried away by the enemy. So I am reviewing my, the doctrines uh, by myself of the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the help of the New Beginnings series from ASI. So this is number three or number four, the origin of evil. Why so much suffering? How evil entered our world? But before we continue, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you forgive us from our sins. Please uh, possess us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit as we study your word. Give us wisdom and understanding in righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, why so much suffering? Uh, there was a uh, lady named Clara Anderson. He, she was a maid in San Francisco. She was a very gentle woman and very conscientious. One day, after having worked for the same employer for 15 years, she disappeared. Her employer had no idea where she went. She seemed to have just disappeared, dropped out of sight. Miraculously, after days of searching, she was found. Clara was in the process of starving herself to death in the mountains outside of San Francisco. She said, I want to die. Leave me alone. When the reporter uh, who ultimately found her interviewed her, Clara said, Look, nobody cares about me. I'm just a maid. Just one of thousands in society doing menial tasks. My life is of no value. I have no close relatives, no family, no friends. I'm so lonely that I don't want to live. There's no one I consider close to me. Nobody I can talk to. Nobody I can open my heart to. So just let me die because nobody really cares. Nobody cares. This is the desperate cry of men and women on a hurting planet. This is why uh, so many people are in trouble. But why is there so much pain? Why are there so many broken hearts and homes? So many tragedies, accidents, and disasters. If God exists, why doesn't he put an end to such suffering? Is he responsible for the difficulties we have to endure? Many people are surprised to learn that the Bible describes a great battle that is going on between the powers of good and evil. It clearly indicates that there is one who is responsible for all the pain and suffering and sorrow experienced on planet Earth. And it is not God. Jesus told a story about a farmer who planted good seed in this field, in his field. But when the plants came up, the field was filled, the field, his field, was filled with terrible weeds. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Matthew thirteen twenty seven. Where did the weeds come from? They wanted to know. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Matthew 13, 37 to 39. So the Bible clearly here reveals that there are two supernatural powers at work in this world. While God is the source of love, unselfishness, joy, and peace, there is another power at work bringing disaster, tragedy, death, and sickness into the lives of God's children. Where did this dreadful evil come from? 
the last book of the Bible, Revelation, tells us. The Bible started at the, the battle started at the throne room of the universe. Revelation 17, 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that servant of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. What a battle that must have been. In Revelation 12, 4, we learned that the conflict was so intense and the devil so deceiving that a third of the angels of heaven followed Satan in his rebellion against God. Revelation 12, 4 says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. How could that happen? How could a perfect being in a perfect universe doubt a God of love? The prophet Ezekiel describes more what happened in Ezekiel 28, 12 to 14. Thus saith the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cherub who covers. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So, Lucifer was a beautiful angel created in a perfect way. He held a very high position in heaven and one of the two angels in heaven one of the two angels standing in either side of the throne of God but he was not content being next to God he was not content he wanted to take the place of God pride and jealousy began a rebellion in Lucifer's heart God said to Lucifer, in, as related by Ezekiel, You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. The beautiful angel became self-centered and greatly desired the, work, the glory and worship that God alone deserves. He had the boldness to challenge his creator for the throne of the universe. Listen to what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. Lucifer's unhappiness and jealousy soon infected others around him. Somehow, through half-truths and lies, and misrepresentations, he convinced the other angels that he was actually the one fighting for fairness and justice, and that God only expected their worship and obedience because he was a power-hungry and unjust God. Lucifer was now accusing God of ev the very evil of selfishness that he had originated in his own heart. Maybe you are wondering, if God is all-powerful, why didn't he just destroy this rebellious angel right there and then? The answer to this question is one of the most important truths to understand. Because the answer is all about the character of God versus the character of his accuser. You see, 
had God destroyed Lucifer for questioning his governance and character, it would have ended his rebellion then and there. But it would have created a bigger question. Was Lucifer right? Does God, in fact, force his creatures to worship him out of vanity and selfishness? That would be the question in the other angels' minds. So, in summarizing the true character of God, the disciple said it very simply in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. The entire war between Christ and Satan is over this. Is it true or not? Whether God is love or not? While destroying Lucifer would have seemingly solved the problem in the short term, it would have been out of character for a God of love. The rest of the universe may have submitted to his authority, but it would have been out of force and fear, not of love. What the Bible is teaching here about to us is about a God that everything he does in fact is about love our god is a relational god who created mankind for the purpose of relationship with him just like there is a relationship within the godhead <clears throat> god made us in his image to have a loving relationship with each other and with him and if there is one ingredient that is absolutely essential to a loving relationship, it is freedom. Love cannot be forced or programmed. It can only exist when it is chosen by one's free will. So, out of fairness and love and in harmony with his character, God allowed the universe to see and experience the principles which are foundational to Satan and his character and his governance by so doing the contrast in their two very different characters becomes more and more clear but you may ask where here why here on this earth why has this little planet become a spectacle to the world both to angels and men according to first corinthians 4 9 this earth, along with our first parents, was created perfect. But Adam and Eve were created with freedom and thus had the ability to do wrong. They were free to choose to love God and obey God or to ignore his warnings and instructions. Since Satan claimed that enlightened creatures would choose his way, their loyalty to God would be tested. And that test would focus on a single tree. God warned, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. In Genesis 2.16 and 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Genesis 2.16 and 17. In the story of Adam and Eve's disobedience, we find the first evidence of the contrast between God's character and Satan's character. God warns with an uncomfortable truth. Satan lies with a flattering, pleasing message that ha just has enough truth to be confusing. He said to Eve, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? In Genesis 3, 1 to 5, we may eat of the fruit, Eve replied, of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 1-5 to 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, he took, she took of its fruit and ate. Genesis 3, 6. Eve gave Adam the fruit and he also ate. They had failed God's test of love and loyalty. And it wasn't long before they knew they had made a grave mistake. As evening came, God arrived at the garden as usual to visit Adam and Eve. Until now, this had been the happiest time of the day. But now they hid in the bushes, attempting to avoid their loving God and Creator. Finally, Adam slipped out of his hiding place and confessed, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Genesis 3.10 Until that day, Adam and Eve had only known good feelings and emotions. Never had they experienced evil, but now they knew fear, shame, anger, and blame. Genesis 3.11 says, Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? God asked. And Adam answered, The woman you gave to me to be with, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Genesis 3.11 The very first day sin entered the human experience. It caused the first fight <laughs> between husband and wife. Adam blames Eve and God who created her for his poor choice. So much for Satan's plan being an improvement on God's. <laughs> but Eve's excuses weren't much better. The serpent deceived me and I ate, according to Eve. In other words, Eve was really saying, it's not my fault, it's the serpent that you made that got me into trouble. Genesis 3, 13. But it wasn't God's fault. God had warned them and told them the truth. He knew all along the heartache that sin would bring. He knew and tried to tell them that it was that if they sinned, they would be separated from him. And he is the source of life. No, it wasn't God's fault. But people have been blaming him ever since the first act of disobedience. It's easy and sometimes popular to blame God for the world's suffering and devastation. But Satan is really the one responsible. He is the one who tempted our first parents to choose his side and who has been causing sin and suffering ever since. When Jesus came to earth, he came to reveal in a clearer way just how loving and self unselfish God is and how merciless and cruel Satan is. As he was teaching in the synagogue one Sabbath, he noticed a woman bent over with a crippling deformity. Touched by her sad situation, Jesus healed her. The rulers instantly criticized Jesus for healing her on the Sabbath day. But notice how Jesus defended his actions. Luke 13, 16. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, for 18 years be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath? Jesus said in Luke 13, 16, that Satan was the one who bound this woman for 18 years. In fact, Satan is behind all the disease, heartache, and death. Perhaps nowhere do we see this truth more clearly than in the book of Job. Sometime, after Adam and Eve's decision that gave Satan authority here on earth, there was a meeting in heaven. Satan attended, evidently as the representative of this planet. And in Job 1.7, God said, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come from? Satan replied, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Job 1, 7. In other words, Satan is claiming to be the prince of the earth, having taken the place of, Satan, of Adam. But Satan's claim to being the representative of earth did not go unchallenged. God said to Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? Job 1, 8. A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and, God, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Soon, disaster struck Job and his family. First, the Sabaeans stole Job's cattle and murdered his workers. Second, lightning struck and killing his sheep and the shepherds. Third, the Chaldeans came and stole Job's camels. Fourth, a tornado destroyed the home of Job's oldest son and all of Job's children were killed. Poor Job. There was no way he could have understood what was happening behind the scenes or the contest between God's love and Satan's selfishness, of which his life was now in the midst of the controversy. Though filled with grief, however, Job's loyalty to God was unchanged. He said, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1 verse 21. But Satan wasn't ready to give up yet. He challenged God again, saying in Job 2, 4-6, Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely cause, curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Job 2, 4-6 Would Job remain loyal to God when things got even worse? Or would he return, uh, turn his back to God? Job 2.7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job 2.7 Imagine being covered with painful boils from head to toe. But Job remained loyal to God. In Job 2.10 it says, In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. <clears throat> now let's be clear here. Who was it that plagued Job? Wiping out his livestock, killing his servants, destroying his children? It was Satan. The Lord may allow difficulties to come our way to test our loyalty and love. But Satan is the guilty one responsible for all the evil on planet earth. You and I are caught in the middle of this cosmic drama. This conflict between authority and lawlessness, between the Creator and Satan, the one with whom evil began. We are not just onlookers, we are involved. Whether we want to be or whether we realize it or not. Like a great cosmic tug of war of character, God is working tirelessly to draw us closer to Him and with our permission to make our characters more and more like His character of unselfish love. At that same time, Satan is also pulling us toward Him, desperately seeking to destroy God's image in mankind and to obliterate goodness from our hearts so we will be thoroughly selfish like Him. And this is life and death, serious matter. This is a serious matter of life and death. Revelation 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Revelation 12, 12. Peter furthermore warns us, Be sober, be vigilant, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. <clears throat> the good news, friends, is that God, is that the God of creation has a plan of redemption for the lost planet. 
He sent his precious son to defeat Satan and redeem his world, this world of in rebellion. Here he was on Satan's territory, born as a helpless babe. Surely Satan must have seen this and his chance to overcome and finally as his chance to overcome and finally conquer. And so Satan worked. He worked through King Herod to destroy the Christ child with the baby boys of Bethlehem. But he was defeated. He came to Jesus in the wilderness with three great temptations, pretending to be an angel from heaven. He was defeated also. He stirred up the crowd to destroy Jesus in Calvary. But though Jesus died on that Roman cross, the devil was completely defeated. Not only because Jesus rose again, but because through it all, the devil's character of selfishness and egotism was revealed in total contrast with God's character of selfless love for sinners. Love is so extreme, so complete, so radical that the creator himself gave his life for his creation. While the devil was willing to kill others in order to grasp for what was not his, Jesus demonstrated once and for all that God was willing to give up everything and die in order to give us that which was his. That's God's character. That's love. And that's why the devil is today a defeated foe. We already know the end of this story. Love wins. God's character is made clear and plain. The devil is unmasked. All that is left for us to decide is whose side will be, we will be on. Who will we believe? Who will we follow? A loving God or a fallen angel? Whose side are you on? You may be wondering about sorrow, heartache, and difficulty in your own life. You may be wondering about the loss of a child or a loved one and ask, where is God? To every restless, lonely heart, to every aching, guilty soul, to all his children on a planet in rebellion, Jesus gives the loving invitation. Come to me, all who you labor, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight. There is a story about uh, Joseph Scriven, who was <clears throat> an Irishman born in 1819 and a graduate of Trinity College in Dublin. He was a well-educated man from a good family. Joseph's life seemed to be going well. He fell in love and was engaged to be married, but the evening before the wedding, his fiance slipped and fell from a horse while crossing a bridge while he waited on the other side. She drowned in the river below before she could be rescued. After this tragedy, Joseph left Ireland and moved to Port Hope, Canada, where he taught and tutored and eventually fell in love again. But again, tragedy struck as his sweetheart fell ill of pneumonia and died before their marriage. Upon hearing of his mother's ailing health in Ireland, and unable to visit her, Joseph wrote a poem for her, which he titled, Pray Without Ceasing. And let's read the poem. It says here, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer.